All right, Fred, just so you know, it's officially open right now. So people can okay. log on early. We're not gonna start our discussion for another five minutes or so, um, but uh, yeah, it's going down. So people might be logging on here. And uh, hey, if you are logging on as you guys are coming in, I'll just say this every uh, 30 seconds, one minute or so, let us know you're here, say hello. Um, and uh, yeah, all we can do is see the chat thread right now. So the only people that I know are on and that Fred know are on are the people that let us know. If you want to be anonymous and be a typical New Englander, that's fine too. Uh, hey, Fred. <laughs> hey, good? Steve. How are you? I'm good. I'm at home. It looks like you're in your office. Yes, I am. I'm, uh, I'm excited to join you tonight for this uh, topic of COVID-19 and how it impacts families. Yeah, well, we're gonna we're gonna start in a few minutes. We're gonna let people hop in. Um, we're, let's do a, a little get to know you game for the people that are tuning in right now. Um, I don't want to jump into any of the really good stuff for a few more minutes, but uh, I'm gonna play a little game with you. I used to play this okay. back when I was a youth pastor called This or That, where I'm gonna give you two things and you got to tell me which one you prefer. All right. Okay. All right. Yeah. Now this one, I have a feeling what your answer is gonna be, but I'm not sure. Uh, Coke or Pepsi? Coke. Really? I, I thought you were going to say yeah. I don't like soda. That, that would have been my guess. Oh, no, that wasn't a choice. Yeah, I know it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, would you prefer to go to the movies or a concert? A concert. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. There you go. What, what about Lisa? Is that what she'd prefer as well? Same page? Um, she she might, it depends on the concert, of course. If it was uh, some romantic crooner, she would definitely want to go to that. <laughs> and if it wasn't a romantic crooner, she would want to go to a movie. There you go. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Okay, what about, uh, what about the beach or the mountains? Where do you prefer to retreat? Oh, the mountains. I knew that one. Yes, I, that one. I know you knew that one. That was an easy one. Yeah, I love the beach, but uh, just something about mountains and a lake. Yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> now this one, I'm curious. I don't know because I know you like both of these things. Uh, would you prefer, if you had to choose, so I'm not saying you don't like either, um, but if you had to choose, would you prefer to go for a bike ride or a run? I would choose the bike ride. Yeah. Yes. Cause I'm getting, I'm getting older and my knees need the help. Oh, I don't, <laughs> you, you're still one of the healthiest, most fit people that I know. So it's still hard. For oh, me. oh, you're so kind. You're so kind. <laughs> All right. I'll hey, come back. Guys. We'll do another one. Yeah, well, uh, hey, as you uh, guys are hopping on, by the way, we're going to start in about two to three minutes. We'll give people a chance. Let us know you're here. Say hey. Uh, we always like this to be interactive, um, mm -hmm. and we'll, we'll try to respond to the chat thread as much as possible. Um, I'm just asking uh, Dr. Kern a few just fun get-to-know-you questions before we get into the, the really good stuff here. Um, all right, Fred, if you had to choose between going or, or watching a brand-new movie or an old classic, what would you do? You know, I'd have to go with the old classic. My yeah. wife and I are, are embarking on uh, the list of the 100 greatest classics of all time. We're so we're starting. We're doing the same thing. We're you are. Yes, we are. Every Sunday yeah, we, Monday, we pick one off the list. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We did breakfast at Tiffany's uh, two weeks ago and just had such a good time with it. Just, That's just awesome. so fun. Just, just so fun to appreciate the greatness of the classics and how culture changes and how film changes, which you're an expert in. But uh, yeah. It, yeah, it was just great. <laughs> so you know, we hope to work ourselves through the list. That is awesome. Um, yeah. All right. Hey, guys, as you are coming in, just say hi. Let us know that you're here. Um, don't. We're not going to force you to answer any questions or anything like that. We just like this to be fun and interactive. We know that there's people watching from all over. I am Steven. This is Fred. Um, and uh, we're going to start in just a few minutes. We're going to give everyone a chance just to hop in. Um, before we do that, I'm just asking Fred some more fun questions. Um, <laughs> let me, and, you know, Fred, that's so funny because we are, we are really doing the same thing. And so if I answer well, we'll that right now. Well, we'll say, have to compare classics. Yes, I'm yeah. sure we're watching the yeah. same movies, it sounds like. Um, <laughs> Lawrence of Arabia. Yeah, exactly. All the old ones. Um, let me ask now, the, the Godfather's on that list too. Oh yeah. Now some of the ones that yeah. we've already seen, we're, we're skipping over a little bit. So we've seen that one and we're looking at some of the ones that we wouldn't normally. Um, well, Hey everybody. Hey, it is eight o'clock. Um, and we are, I'm going to give everyone just one more minute to hop in. If you want to say, Hey, let us know who you are, where you're watching from. Um, maybe even the age of your kids that might even help us to know how to answer some of the questions that, 
I, I right. say I'm not answering any of them. Fred's going to be answering them, but it'll help him to just have a little bit more information. Um, this is our first webinar. We're going to actually be doing these weekly on Wednesday nights at eight o'clock, just like this. Each week will be a different topic and it'll be different people discussing. Um, so um, as you guys log in and are hopping on, just say, hey, let us know you're here. Um, we always like to know, like, where are you watching from? Uh, do you have any uh, people watching with you? Uh, do you have, obviously, I'm assuming most people watching have kids, so let us know their ages. Um, let me ask Fred one more question as we give people just a little bit more. If you could travel anywhere in the world that you've never been before, where would you go? Um, I think I would go do an African safari, Stephen. I would love really? to go wow. there and do a, a photographic safari. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Love, is... love, love the animals of Africa and all documentaries I've seen. I'd love to travel there. Yeah. That is awesome. Have you ever been to Africa at all? Any parts? I, I went on a missions trip to Gabon in 2000, uh, 2010 uh, with the youth group and just had a phenomenal time there. And That's uh, awesome. It was just the, just a great experience for us all, but yeah, it was it was a wonderful thing to be in in that continent. It's it's an amazing place, as you know. That's awesome. Well, uh, yeah, awesome. Well, hey everybody, it is now just after eight o'clock. I know people are hopping on. As you are, feel free to say hi. Let us know where you're watching from. Let us know um, the age of your kids. Um, none of that's necessary. We just like to make this as interactive and fun as we can. Um, my name is Stephen. Um, and uh, this is Fred, uh, Fred Kern, that I think Hello. many of you know. Um, I, he, uh, I remember about a year ago, Fred, I called you Dr. Kern, and you asked me to call you Fred instead, that I know you prefer casual. Yeah. So uh, yes. so if, if you ever meet Fred in person, know that he loves the casual. Um, yeah, that's right. He doesn't, doesn't want to be a reverend uh, separation between you kind of guy, which is awesome. Um, <laughs> Fred, when's the last time you had a conversation that hundreds of people were listening in and weren't in the room with you? <laughs> Has that ever happened before? <laughs> Not in the same room. No, I think this is my first venture. Yeah, yeah. webinars yeah. Are, are unique. They're kind of like the virtual equivalent of like an FBI stakeout where we're in this room and it's bugged and people in other rooms all over are listening in. So that's, it's kind of this unique thing as we are uh, using technology to get out some really, really good content. Um, but Yeah, it's just great, isn't it? I mean, we've really uh, started to do a lot of telemedicine in our practice and, you know, we didn't do that eight weeks ago and now we're doing about 50% of our uh, sick visits are on telemedicine and it's become, wow. second, it's become second nature to us. And the families really appreciate not having to leave the house for things that they don't have to. So that's been a paradigm shift for us and as it is for our church too. So yeah, yeah, there's a lot of good things that have come from it. That's awesome. And I imagine, you know, we're seeing this in the church world as well, that some of these practices that you have had to adapt towards, um, you might just keep doing them even after the bands are lifted because they're so beneficial, right? So it's forcing yeah. you. Yeah, absolutely, especially in the realm of um, behavioral health. So we have three full-time behavioral health care providers, and they're doing 100% of their visits with families and kids are uh, virtually. That's awesome. And, well, and they're, me... quite, they're quite busy, too. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, Katie's, Katie has hopped on to one um, just in the past few weeks, and um, we were like, oh, we should, like, this was, this was much easier. And if it can be done virtually, it makes it a little bit easier for everybody. Um, right. Well, let me do some intros here so people know um, who you are. Um, I'll start with myself because mine is very short. Um, uh, my name is Stephen. I am one of the pastors at Grace Church. I specifically lead our West Bridgewater location um, that Fred attends with us every single week. Um, I'm married, my wife Katie. We've been married nine years. We have two kids uh, as well. So just so you guys know, I'm taking this as this is going because I'm also a parent that is very interested in uh, some of the answers to these questions. And I've got two girls that are four and two years old. Um, I'm a world renowned whistler, um, but enough about me. Uh, Dr. Kern, which is uh, the expert that is in the window, um, has been practicing uh, as a pediatrician for 33 years, um, all in the greater, in the South Shore area, Brockton, Bridgewater. Um, uh, you you founded uh, Bridgewater Pediatrics in 2000 mm -hmm. that many, many of the people that are listening in have kids that go or or maybe they they actually went when they were uh, younger and 
Uh, you got your pediatric training, your, your PhD from Duke University. You are a Blue Devil. Yes, that's right. That is that's awesome. right. That's awesome. <laughs> um, well, let me let me just uh, let, let's just we'll kind of go right into this here. Um, we're obviously in in unique times right now. I never thought I would see the day that the government would actually fine us for not wearing a face mask into a bank. But here we are. <laughs> and, and I think we're all trying to figure out um, the wisest way uh, to, to just walk through our week, to lead our kids, um, and to stay uh, safe and healthy. And so um, just for you guys that are watching, here's what the overview is going to uh, be like. The view that you see right now is not what you're going to see the entire time. Um, because I, I really want the focus of this to be on Fred talking to you. And so um, we're going to switch into an interview style format where we um, have collected questions. Um, all of these are questions that many of you have already written in before this webinar even started. As you signed up, we gave you the opportunity to write down questions. We kind of looked at them and uh, we compiled them and looked at some of the frequently asked ones and some of the themes. And we came up with several questions. A few of them are related just to health practices, um, to, to safety, to how can we stay active. Some are related to home education, to schooling. And, um, and I think having uh, Fred's insight here will be helpful for all of us. So I encourage you, um, if you have your phones or like I've got my notebook seriously right here that I'm gonna ask a question, I'm gonna turn off my camera and, and just be ready to take notes. So Fred, are you ready to get into it? I sure am, Stephen. Thanks for the privilege to share this time with you. I appreciate it. Awesome. And thank you guys all for tuning in. Um, like we said, if you want, if you want to, if there's anything that Fred says um, that, that really stands out to you, feel free to type it in. Or maybe if there's something said that um, you, you want us to go back to and elaborate on or a follow-up question, um, we'll try to do that as much as we can. So let me ask the first questions. Um, are, are kids, which is obviously your, your primary focus, are kids showing the same symptoms as adults in regards to the virus? Yeah, Stephen, in general, uh, children do show the same symptoms of COVID-19 infection as adults. And the main symptoms are cough, <clears throat> shortness of breath, um, muscle aches, pains, fever, sore throat, headache, uh, flu-like illness. Um, in particularly in adults, uh, there's been new findings that show that a lot of people will lose their sense of taste and smell for the first time. Uh, that occurs for no other reason. So those are the main symptoms. And uh, children can have many of the same symptoms that adults can have. Uh, they ha tend to have uh, a little bit less of an incidence of shortness of breath, uh, but all the other symptoms uh, are same, uh, the same okay. as uh, adults. Now, I also want to point out that, uh, that infants are at much higher risk for COVID-19 infection uh, than uh, older children. And I uh, also want to point out a very important um, fact is that children that have underlying chronic illnesses, uh, such as immunodeficiencies or heart disease or cancers, those children are very much at risk for uh, contracting uh, COVID-19 and having complications from it. Okay. Um, well, let me ask a follow-up with that then. It, it, we're hearing a lot of opinions right now, and I think part of the goal of this webinar is to help people to understand where the truth is. And even at the end, we'll give a few resources that will help people to know trusted, reliable, consistent uh, truth where it's, it's being communicated. Um, from your educated perspective, how vulnerable are kids to the virus? Is it the same as adults? And what are some of the things that we should be most aware of right now in regards to that? I think the first thing is just to be aware, as I'm sure everyone is, that we truly are in the middle of a pandemic yeah. that's affecting um, young children, um, middle-aged parents, and the elderly. Uh, children are just as vulnerable as adults to COVID-19 infection. In fact, uh, many parents may know that children are asymptomatic carriers of the disease, and this is a real key point in why um, physical distancing and wearing masks is so important because if children uh, contract a virus and then they're asymptomatic, they can bring it home to uh, elderly or frail grandparents or relatives or other people in the home that have chronic diseases that really should not be exposed to this uh, very contagious virus. Um, so I think that's a very important point about children. Fortunately, 
uh, children <coughs> get sick um, much less frequently than adults do. They're susceptible to the same symptoms, uh, but they tend to have much milder courses. And we really don't understand that at this point in the pandemic. Why are children seemingly spared from uh, very bad outcomes? Yeah. Now, uh, we, we all read the same papers. We all know that there are children who sadly end up being hospitalized, uh, being admitted to intensive care units, sometimes being placed on ventilators. Uh, but that's a that's a very, very small percentage of the number of children that COVID that get COVID-19 infections. So, so fortunately for our children, they tend to get uh, less severe disease. Um, but the big point is they can be asymptomatic carriers, bring it home uh, to those who are sick, frail, or elderly. Mm. Okay. Um, can, can you share, I'm sure there are parents here that know the importance of wearing a mask, but it's prob it can very easily be a struggle to convince your kid of that and the importance <laughs> of them wearing a mask they're not used to and it may feel scary or uncomfortable. Can you just share what wearing a mask and practicing social distancing does to slow down the spread of the virus? Yes, the, there's two important points uh, and reasons why we want to be wearing masks. And as you know, Stephen, the governor of Massachusetts is just um, created an order whereby it's now required to wear a mask if you go out in public and you cannot ensure that you're socially distant from another person. So I think it's a great practice. I, I personally feel like wearing a mask is the most important thing that we can do to stem the tide of the COVID-19 pandemic as we go out into the public. Now, now staying at home, uh, quarantining, uh, physical distancing, all very important points in addition to hand washing. But when we venture out into society, it's wearing the mask that's really going to keep us safe. So so the mask will uh, prevent the wearer uh, from getting exposed to droplet spread of the virus through saliva, through cough, sneezing. So it protects you, the wearer, but it also prevents if you uh, have an asymptomatic infection, and you're brewing the virus, but you're not sick yet, if you wear a mask and you go out in public, you're not gonna transmit it to other people that you're gonna meet in the grocery store, the pharmacy, et cetera, et cetera. So the mask protects both the wearer and everybody else uh, from giving COVID-19, it's really yeah. important. Yeah. And I think, I think if I might add, I think wearing a mask is gonna be with us for quite some time. Um, and I think, you know, it's a hard thing to get used to, uh, but it's really important. Here's my uh, N95 mask there you go. that I wear all day long in the office. <laughs> it's really tight on my nose and I don't like it, but uh, <laughs> I wear it plus my protective eyewear. Yeah. It's it's really, we just have to get used to it. This is the new normal for us yeah. in the time of COVID-19. And as I say, I, I think we, we just have to get used to this. And it's very, very important uh, for us and our families and to society in general. And it's, uh, there's a recommendation from the state uh, that every child over the age of two should be wearing a mask. Yeah. So we're starting to see children as young as two years old come in wearing masks. And I must admit, I'm happy to report that most of them seem like they're doing pretty yeah. well. Yeah, we, we have one custom made that has Winnie the Pooh for our girls. And oh, we, perfect. We, trying to turn it into a game so that they can look forward to it. Um, and, <laughs> you know, one of That's the things great. I was going to- wonderful. Yeah, and one of the things you said that I think is a good reminder for myself, because earlier on, if I'm being very honest, uh, a month ago, when the masks weren't mandatory, but strongly encouraged, um, it felt it is uncomfortable. You feel goofy at first when you're walking in. It, feels, it felt for a lot of us a little bit overboard. And then I heard something that changed my whole mindset, uh, is that when you're wearing the mask, it's, it's not just for you. And it's not, if you, you might feel 100%, it really is out of respect for the people you're walking by, especially those that are high risk. And, yeah. and as you and I are both Christ followers, and that, that really resonated with me that um, I always want to take actions that help, uh, help me to consider the person I'm walking by more than myself, right? I think, I think you're so right about that, Stephen. And um, it also does two other things. It uh, reminds us to keep our hands away from our face while we're out in public. And uh, just kind of like you just mentioned, Stephen, it gives us 
a kind of a reverence for other people and and a, and a commitment to saying when I wear my mask when I go to the grocery store it's showing that I care about other people it's showing that I'm committed I'm personally committed to doing what I can do to end this terrible pandemic so um, good great point let me ask, thank you uh, a question that dives in a little bit deeper about communication what what's the best way to talk about this with our younger kids. Um, and I'm not just saying the masks, I'm saying the whole situation. Most of the people in the thread have young kids, just like mine. Um, how, can they, how can they communicate this to help them understand the situation without increasing fear and anxiety? Well, I think the first thing to do is just uh, continue to be calm, to be reassuring, loving and gentle with our children. I think it's important that we answer all their questions in an age in an age appropriate manner. Uh, never avoid the truth, uh, but just speak to their level, speak to their level of understanding and, and try to understand what the concern is behind the question. And I think it's important to tell our children that we're all practicing precautions uh, to keep us and our family safe and, um, and for society in general. And I think it's also uh, goes a long way, depending on the age of your child, to just reassure them that researchers and doctors are learning as much as they can about this virus. And so very quickly, we'll have a vaccine, we'll have improved treatments. And I, and I think this is important to mention because mm. God gives us uh, researchers, he gives us medicine, he gives us vaccines so that we can become healthier people and uh, I think it's important to to mention that to our kids because that therein lies the medical hope uh, for the situation. I think it's also a good idea to give uh, remind our children that they actually yeah. have some yeah. control in the situation. They also have a part uh, in this pandemic, um, and they can do their part: uh, hand washing, uh, coughing into their sleeves. But hopefully, they'll have their mask on in, in public. So, coughing into their mask if they do cough, and getting enough sleep, eating well. Uh, being rested, um, and so they get so giving children control over their own um, destiny for their own physical health and the protection of their family. I think it's important to look for signs of anxiety in our kids. Um, we're not going to necessarily express the words that we would consider uh, being uh, symptoms of an underlying anxiety, but they may be more cranky, they may be more clingy, they might have trouble sleeping uh, and seem distracted. Uh, so I think it's just imperative upon uh, us on uh, as parents to watch for these hidden signs of anxiety. Uh, behavioral changes in our kids, I think, are very important. Uh, next, I want to mention it's important to monitor the media. Um, keep children away from frightening images that are not age appropriate on TV, social media, computers. Um, and it's when you do hear a news report, and your your older child is listening to the report it's good to engage them in conversations like well you heard some really distressing numbers about hospitalizations or death from covid-19 how how do you how do you react to that what do you, what do you think when you hear those those uh, those uh, sad and discouraging numbers so just engage our children as they learn and hear about this and i've been i've been impressed in the office that the younger children, three, four years old, uh, they can say the word uh, <laughs> coronavirus, and they know they know a little bit about it. It's it's yeah. really quite remarkable um, that uh, it's definitely yeah. on the airways, no, no matter where we turn. And I think in terms of media, I think it's also very important to to yeah. shut the news yeah. off from time to time. Um, I'm sure, like me, Stephen, you're probably glued to the radio yeah. you're glued to your computer your news feed because right. because we need to know we need to be informed as public servants uh, what's going on around us how can we best protect ourselves and our families and our loved ones and society in general so but it's important yeah. to turn the news off too because uh, uh we don't want to be digesting Absolutely. it 24 yeah, 7. and i think uh part of what you just said that that resonated with me is the necessary conversation some of us are having to have with our young kids that we wouldn't normally have with them at their at this age. And um, just earlier tonight, I was talking to my four year old Hazel um, because we had a friend uh, last week pass away, and we were just trying to explain that to her. 
and uh, she was asking questions about it. And obviously she doesn't fully grasp the weight of the situation. Um, so I, right. I, it wouldn't, I don't know if it hit her as much as it would if she was a few years older even. Um, but it's hard to have those conversations. And, and uh, yes. especially yeah. when we're walking in, we're a part of the situation as well. And, and so uh, with, I wanna ask a question, um, a follow up to, to something you said. Um, for those, and this really goes beyond the virus. Um, this is more of a mental health question. For those who really are right now, uh, them or their kids struggling with fear and anxiety towards us, just what general advice or methods would you suggest to help lower the level of anxiety? I think, I think an important point is to continue to um, answer our children's questions in, a, in an open, honest, age-appropriate way. Um, children do very well with truth. Um, in, in fact, related to your previous point about how do we talk to our children about death, uh, they do very well with uh, with truth. Uh, it's when we kind of beat around the bush and and uh, don't really go 100% of the truth, that's when they get confused and that's when they um, have more questions uh, raised than than answers given. So I think it's important to to be honest, to be truthful. And if we don't know the answer to the question, just say, you know, I don't know, but I'll I'll get back to you. We'll look into that. That's a really good question. And I think I think as our church family, I think the first thing to do if we're finding ourselves or our children really kind of out there on the anxiety limb is to talk to God in prayer and tell him that, look, God, I'm, I'm afraid. I'm afraid for my grandfather who has a chronic disease. I'm afraid for my new baby. And obviously God cares for us and knows our hearts and wants us to experience his peace. So I think the first thing to do is just be honest with God and tell him, I'm really anxious today. I'm worried about the reports that I'm hearing on the TV or radio. So just to be honest with God, he knows that this is a very anxiety provoking time for all of us. Um, um, and he loves us and we need to go to him. I think talking to other um, trusted friends uh, within the church, um, outside the church, um, share your fears, your concerns. Sometimes when we're cooped up in quarantine, our, our minds can play tricks on us and we think we're the only ones worried about uh, item A, B, or C, and then you talk to your friends and say, oh gosh, yeah, sure, I'm, I'm concerned about that as well. So I think talking to others, reaching out, uh, staying uh, physically distant, but socially connected is really important. And they can be like a, a lifesaver to pull us back in uh, from the edge. So I think remaining connected with the people that you trust and staying connected to your friends uh, and to trusted advisors, I think is a very important point. Uh, and if you're in Christian community and a life group, I know our life group meets uh, every week and we get on there for an hour and a half and we share our fears, we share our, our concerns, we share our victories, we share our challenges. Um, and I found that very, very helpful to talk with others that I know really have my best interest at heart. Um, I think another thing that we can do, Stephen, is to have family meetings um, just on a regular basis. So uh, when you sit down at the dinner table with your children, talk about their day, uh, talk about things that they've heard and seen. Um, hopefully, you know, it's not going to be conversation all around the coronavirus, uh, but uh, talk about and reinforce these important concepts of wearing the mask, washing our hands, physically distancing, uh, caring about others. Uh, looking and praying for opportunities to serve others. And we can really impart a lot of uh, values to our kids uh, this way. And then I think lastly, just telling our kids that they're doing a great job. You know, if, if, uh, if you're fortunate, if you're blessed, your children and your family have not experienced uh, COVID-19 directly in your home, you know, that means that you're doing a great job um, and you just need to keep going. And so we can all use the a healthy dose of positive encouragement. That's great. Thank you for that. I took a bunch of notes, so I'm just catching up on the question. Yeah. Here. Um, what recommendations? I want to switch the conversation a little bit to talking about schooling, um, home education, uh, which is a huge part of it. Talk a little bit about physical activity. Um, what recommendations do you have for parents that are now homeschooling their kids and it's a it's completely new 
territory for them. Um, you know, some of them are also trying to work as well. Can you just share some thoughts here? Sure. Well, first off is, again, let's let's be honest. This is a, an anxiety provoking time for all of us. It's really a paradigm shift in how we live our lives. We're on quarantine. Uh, we're physically distant. We're not we're not going to the workplace as much. We're not going to church gatherings. We're not going to small group meetings. Um, it's really a stressful time for all. I mean, all this is very, very stressful for, for all of us. And so what we need to do, um, I think both as adults <coughs> and children, uh, children in particular thrive on routine. They thrive on predictability. They, they thrive on knowing, okay, when I get up in the morning, I give mom and dad a hug and a kiss and uh, I watch a cartoon and then we have breakfast. And then after breakfast, we brush our teeth and then we go outside. So I think a routine is really important for children. Uh, for parents that have school age children, um, I think you wanna have the kids go to bed at their usual time, try to get up as close to the usual time as possible. Um, because most kids that are in school are doing some online schooling, have breakfast at a normal time, get dressed, um, try to make try to make the day as uh, close closely resembling a, your typical school day as possible. And then with uh, kids doing online schooling, uh, parents working at home, I think we need to decide which areas of the house mom and dad work out of, which areas of the house uh, kids do their schoolwork in. And <clears throat> when you have younger children, if both mom and dad are working from the home, uh, setting up a schedule. Okay. Mom is uh, working from eight to 10, dad is supervising the young children, uh, and then uh, the other parent takes over the, uh, over the child care, and then the other parent sits down at their desk or computer. So <clears throat> just having a, a schedule, I think is very helpful. Uh, listing the times for the children when we have learning time, when we have times of breaks, when we have times of exercise, either indoors or outdoors. <clears throat> And for younger children, you typically have like 20 minutes of classroom assignments followed by 10 minutes of physical activity. Again, depending on the weather, if it's a beautiful day outside, you can go outside and take a walk. Uh, if it's a rainy day, then you can stay inside and do jumping jacks, sit-ups, push-ups, and kind of make it fun. Um, <clears throat> watch an, excuse me, watch an exercise video. Older children and teens, of course, can probably focus for longer periods of time. They've got more work to do, and um, they too, though, need to be taking breaks between their subjects and interacting with the families. Um, so um, there's still gonna be an end to the workday, whether it's your school day or work day, and you need to tell your children and your family, okay, uh, pick the hour, whether, excuse me, it's three, four, or 5 p.m., our work day is over, <clears throat> our family time is started and dinner's gonna be served in a half hour. Again, having kids uh, looking forward to routine. I think the breaks are really important. Uh, fa family dinners are really important. Uh, lunches are good, especially for young kids. Snacks are important and give kids something to look for forward to as they're learning at home, they're doing some online schooling. And then I think, <clears throat> Pardon me. The evening time should be spent um, being together, hanging out together, um, enjoy playing game, games that you never played, reading, watching movies together, exercising together, switch it up, build a fort, write to a re relative, uh, FaceTime a friend, uh, FaceTime relatives. So you can kind of rotate these fun activities in, in the evening just to kind of make it fun. And um, like normal times when we're not on quarantine, uh, bedtime routines are really important for children. Um, so whatever you, your family bedtime routine is, um, brush teeth, read a book, say your prayers, uh, go to bed. Uh, those routines should be kept going. Again, children really thrive on routines. So I, yeah, I think that's, that's good. important. I, I took and, and by the way, if, uh, if you guys are able to access the chat and you if there's any of those that really resonated with you or if you have any other suggestions of things that you have seen with your own family that you want to add to the discussion 
feel free to do just that. Um, one of the things that I'm hearing over and over is keep that routine. Try to say <coughs> students at school have a very specific schedule. It's not it's not fluid. It doesn't change every day, right. and they they respond well to that. So trying to imitate that as much as possible. I even love the idea. That's something that my wife and I could improve on. Is is setting specific places in the house um, that it, it are exclusive to where you work. So you're not sitting on the couch, you, you're sitting at the table and that's the one place that you're gonna be and while you're working, you're not being disrupted. Um, yeah, I think that's great. Um, do you have, are there, any, yeah. are there any boundaries that you hit, didn't already hit that might be good for, some, for families to set right now in regards to daily schedules? You may have already, already hit it as far as the times and the spaces, anything else you wanna add there for boundaries? We got a lot of questions about that one. Yeah, I, I, I think just kind of like when we're not in quarantine, children understand that there are times when parents, you know, have to shower, they have to eat, they have to get dressed, they have to go, go to work, they have to talk on the phone, they have to pay bills, they have to do their email. Um, so I think I think our kids are well versed in in that sort of schedule mind. Um, it's just that being at home uh, when maybe just mom is used to being at home or dad used to being at home and the kids are off at either daycare or school. So now we have, you know, like with your family, Stephen, you've got four people at home now and, yep. excuse me, and uh, you know, maybe you spent more time um, out of the home doing appointments. Maybe yep. Katie was at the coffee shop. So, so you just have a lot more people at home and you just got to figure out the spaces and figure out the times for all the different activities that you want to have excuse me, on your schedule um, during the day. Yeah, I'd like to kind of shift to, this was a question we had by a few different people from different perspectives, but could you give any suggestions on how to deal with uh, what naturally a lot of us are seeing with our kids being at home, with everybody being in one house? One of the most common prayer requests I've seen is just sanity, um, is just trying to and, you know, there's, it's tongue in cheek a little bit, but we get the heart behind it. Um, it, it can be very, very difficult. Um, there's probably for many people listening an increased frequency of tantrums or hostile attitudes just from kids because they're out of the routine. Uh, there's a heightened level of stress. There's a heightened level of uncertainty. Um, they're not able to interact with friends and do the things that they don't normally want to do. Could you just give suggestions on maybe how to respond to that in a healthy way as a parent? Yes, and I think Stephen, you you uh, really started the, that question well because, again, you know we're all experiencing uh, really heightened anxiety um, in our families, in our workplaces. Uh, perhaps uh, mom and dad are unemployed at this point, um, wanting to know how the bills are going to be paid next month. Uh, so these are things that are you know our food supply. Um, we have all kinds of questions that most of us haven't really had to struggle with in the past. So these things by definition are, you know, am I going to have money to pay the mortgage? These things are very stressful and they certainly Im impact us as parents. And I think when we're stressed as parents, that certainly flows through the family to our children. So I think just acknowledging it, that these are very stressful times uh, for us as parents, as adults. Um, and so we've got to expect that some of that stress is going to be transmitted through the parents uh, down to the children. And, you know, that's that's just the nature of where we are right now in our society. So I think we need to just admit it and say, say it for what it is. It's a stressful time. And, and you, know, you, you know, if you're normally a cool, calm, collected parent, there may be times when you won't be with COVID-19 because of all these uh, external factors that are really affecting our emotional lives. So I think just recognizing that if you're married, uh, recognizing that, that that's going to be a stress on your spouse and your spouse may not um, be acting quite the same way as, as he or she may, may be. And, and certainly that's true for the children. So recognizing it as the new reality, at least when we're in this quarantine time, I think is, you know, it's like, okay, everybody else is deal dealing with the same thing. In terms of the children, uh, they're going to have different emotions. They're they're going to be exhibiting some different behaviors, especially pre-verbal children. And I think a couple of things that we can do to help them is number one, redirect bad behavior. Um, sometimes children act act up 
out because they're bored or they don't know any better or they're tired of being inside for three days straight because it's raining in April. So redirect their behavior, find something new or different for them to do. Uh, next would be creative play. Uh, suggest that children draw pictures of the ways that your family is staying safe. <laughs> Might make a collage that has nice messages, uh, hand washing, physical distancing, wear your mask. So kind of make it fun, reinforce uh, good concepts, um, but make it fun. Uh, do some art together through making of a collage. Build an indoor fort or a cat or a castle. Um, bring in your favorite stuffed animals or toys to uh, inside your castle to keep the coronavirus out. Um, reinforce good behaviors is always a very important parenting uh, and discipline um, tool that parents have. Reinforce good behaviors, discourage others. Notice when your child when your child is doing something good, a good behavior when they're being caring, they're sharing, they're thoughtful, they're considerate. Make a big deal out of that and praise the successes and their good efforts. Um, you always have to have clear expectations of child behavior, um, but in, especially in this time uh, where may, maybe you wouldn't praise your child's particular act of caring or sharing, but maybe because we're all cooped up together, we need to kind of up the, uh, up the encourage encouragement and, and reward actions as parents to reinforce those good behaviors. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. I think knowing uh, when to not respond to our, our children's behavior, our behavior is also important. Um, there's certain things that we all have to overlook, right? That's, that's part of developing the gift of patience as well. You know, I'm not sure why they did this or why they said this, but it didn't feel real good. But I think right now, it, I'm just going to choose to overlook that and right. and go on my way for a minute. And if if I need to, I can come back and address that at a later time. So knowing when to not respond, I think, is key. For younger children, using the concept of time out is a very helpful thing to do. Um, telling uh, the, what the children did wrong, um, not that they're bad kids, but what they did was wrong. Um, and I'm going to have you sit um, over here on this chair for uh, one minute for each year of age. So a three-year-old would get three minutes in timeout, set a timer, and then when the timer goes off, have a nice calm conversation with your child, talk about review why, uh, what they did, uh, the, behavior, the behavior that was wrong, and why you needed to um, draw attention to it, and then uh, give them a big hug kiss and go off and do something fun together. So I think um, those are some some ideas that I think can be helpful for caring for, for young right. children. I took so many notes there. I hope you guys did too, because there's some really, really good <laughs> suggestions in there. And maybe part of the theme of this is, I think sometimes when we're busy, um, we, we go to the shortcuts in parenting and we do whatever's the easiest and the quickest. Um, and in times like this, it's really easy to become lazy and complacent, not calling anybody out. I just think that's the default we tend to have. Um, and so just continuing to be creative. I love the idea of, of even turning the narrative of, uh, of the conversations about the uh, coronavirus by drawing pictures. And, and even, uh, like you said, I like the idea. We, we build forts in our homes with our girls, but actually building a fort to keep the coronavirus yeah. out, I think it's important to help them to understand um, that we're not making light of it, but at the same time, we are um, turning it into a conversation that doesn't always lead to stress and, and have to be heavy and negative all of the time. Um, I, I think a lot of what you were saying, it really applies to all of our relationships beyond parenting. The idea of this time now um, more than, than normal, just going out of our way to encourage, um, to praise, to highlight things that we may not have highlighted quite as much two months ago, but doing it right now because we're emotionally vulnerable, I think is especially important. Um, yeah, and I, I think, you know, you know, something that uh, I've certainly heard you teach a lot about, Stephen, is cultivating that attitude of gratitude. It is so important because, you know, if we focus on what we don't have, I, I, I've said to many people, I said, you know, this has really caused me to rethink the luxuries that I, I used to enjoy uh, two months ago, the, the privilege and luxury of being able to go out to breakfast, lunch or dinner 
with friends or family member, you know, virtually any time uh, it would fit into my schedule. That that's an incredible luxury. And I now that I don't have that that same luxury due to uh, restaurants being closed, I I look back and I think, you know, I'm I'm very very grateful for that. And and I think when restaurants open up, I'm gonna I hope that I continue to have that same gratitude. What is like one place or activity or restaurant you can't wait to go to when everything opens back up? Well, number one, of course, would be the Bridge Coffee there House in West Bridge. <laughs> <laughs> I can always get a great yes, cup of can. coffee. Yes, you can. That's awesome. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think uh, just uh, I like to go to breakfast places like uh, Good Days Restaurant in West Bridgewater. I like that one. Yeah. Um, uh, Percy's down Route Eight, eighteen in uh, Middleborough. I like to go to that one as That's well. Awesome. So, and just 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 getting together with friends and yeah. family members. Uh, you know, Zoom is great, <laughs> but boy, it's a whole lot nicer to you know yeah. being in in someone's direct company. And I think we all feel that now. Uh, yeah. Hey, and guys in the chat thread, as you're listening in, if you want to give a shout out to your favorite local business that you cannot wait to go to. When all of the bands are lifted, throw it in there so we know what you're thinking of and what you're missing. Um, and uh, and as Fred say anything, if you guys again, if you have any suggestions or any things you've seen as fun family activities, things to keep yourselves active um, when you can't do all of the normal active activities, throw them in there um, uh, so that we can just have that conversation. Go, oh, there's some good ones. Oh, Farmer's Daughter, you, you got to plan that one ahead there um, just for the wait. That's awesome. Um, thank you guys for being interactive. I wanna ask Fred just one more question here and then we're gonna give out, uh, we're just gonna give a few links to some resources. Um, I also wanna say um, Brian or, or Matt, um, who are two of the leaders at Grace Church with us, if you, if you guys could put the link in uh, for the, um, the Facebook page that we, we were just starting for all of the South Shore Kids activities because there's some really good suggestions on there as well. And we'll be having some resources that are already up in, in the next few weeks that some of the people that are a part of this conversation would be really interested in and may not even be there. Um, so if you guys could throw that in the link and just let uh, them know about that, that'd be awesome. Fred, let's end with this question here. Um, I, Cause I think it's, it's, it's really important that we end on a positive note. You and I have outside of this conversation talked many, many times about um, that there are positives to what is happening. And, and creatively, there's a lot of ideas we're seeing. There's businesses that are doing things they never would have done if not for this. So we know that this is a very difficult time, um, but what are some of the positives that you're seeing coming out of this pandemic for us? Yeah, I think that number one on most people's list just be the uh, increased family time that we've gotten to have together. I mean. Uh, it's it's great with with most moms and dads working at home. Um, it's it's great. It's really kind of redefined our family experience. And yeah, there's there's struggles, and we've talked about um, how to redirect children when they're not behaving in a manner that we want to see them behave. Uh, sure, there's struggles there, uh, but there's a lot of great family memories that are being made through this pandemic. And I think we'll all look back and, and say, you remember that pandemic in 2020? We we sat around the dinner table. We laughed. We made memories. We watched movies together. We uh, we, we wrote a play together. Uh, we did a family devotional for the first time. Uh, there's all kinds of fun family things that uh, the families are doing because they're, they're spending a lot more time together. Um, so I think that's probably the best benefit. I think another benefit is that we're looking for opportunities to serve one another. Uh, it certainly doesn't take much to look around and see people that need uh, financial assistance, people that need food assistance, people that need rides to uh, medical appointments, uh, people that need encouragement, people that need prayer. Um, reconnecting with our neighbors that we don't usually see. So I think there's all kinds of wonderful opportunities and silver linings that we're seeing. Uh, I know for my family, uh, we have a new puppy and we take that dog to uh, Mass Massasoit State Park on a regular basis. And that's been a lot of fun. We do that together. Uh, we explore the park, places we've been 
not been before um, and we get to enjoy the new dog, uh, we get to enjoy our, our family's company. Uh, so I think there's a lot of silver linings here. And um, I think just finding a lot more activities that we can do within the confines of our own home that hopefully will, uh, will last moving forward. Because New England winters are long and we're moving into the summer, which yeah. is fantastic. But some of the some of the things that that we're all learning about how to be together better as families, I, I hope will carry us forward yeah, into the I, future. I hope as well. so too. I, I think we're all ready seeing some of the emotional tide shift a little bit just with the weather becoming prettier and warmer and seeing, I mean, you and I, Fred, we live on the same street. So we see the same people walking up and down the street <laughs> now that uh, it's just nice to see, yeah. that, you know, the weather really does affect the mood. So the fact that this hit and we had uh, a longer winter as it was, you know, that added to all of this. Um, so thank you. There really are a lot of uh, positive things that are coming out and that's not making light and that's not stepping over um, all of the hardships um, that many of us are facing as a result of this time of quarantine. Um, but uh, for, for a lot of it, it is perspective. And I think it's so important, just as you said, uh, Fred, to yeah. um, take time to appreciate. And I, I often think of in seasons like this, uh, two years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, none of us are ever going to forget this. We know that. Um, when we look towards the future and we're remembering, like, what are the history books going to write about? What, are, what is the Sargent family history book how are we going to tell this story? And I think you're right. I think what we're mostly going to remember is the amount of family time we had and the, um, it, you know, I've had to cancel three different trips that I had during this time and it's time with family I wouldn't have had. And so um, I think you're absolutely right. Um, I want to, I want to, I just want to, I'm going to throw this mm -hmm. in the chat thread too. Before we talked, I asked um, Fred, just uh, th there's, there is so uh, many conflicting sources on news for what's happening in the uh, coronavirus that it's almost overwhelming and it's hard to know where to go to really find trusted, uh, reliable um, outlets for that. And so I asked Fred for, if he could just give a few, I'm gonna put them in the thread, um, but he said healthychildren.org, um, cdc.gov, and then the Mass Department for Public Health, uh, just the website there is, that's gonna be the most accurate information because it's not a commentary. Um, it's just sharing what's happening. Fred, did you want to say anything about either of those sites? I'm putting it in the thread for there. Yeah, they're they're all excellent. And um, I, I do appreciate your concern for uh, accurate information. And, um, you know, Stephen, if I may just say one other uh, area that we didn't touch on uh, that I, I think is important um, is the notion of testing. Um, as most of us know, it's called a nasopharyngeal swab where you put a swab up the nose and it goes all the way back. So it's recommended that um, most, most children not be tested unless there's a compelling reason to do so. And you should call your doctor's office if you think your child does need a test. And the other thing I just wanted to mention ver very briefly, especially for children, is there's a lot of talk in the news about blood antibody testing. And there are many, many companies, research labs, universities that are doing um, testing development for antibodies, but uh, that is nowhere near um, uh, ready for prime time at this time. And so again, I would just w wait a couple more months and um, I'm, I'm sure uh, within the next six to, six to 12 months, we'll have uh, several good antibody tests that will tell us whether or not we've been infected and whether or not we're protected against a future coronavirus infection. So thanks. Thanks for letting me mention that. Because that's another, uh, con we're hearing a lot of conversations about that. So to hear from you is very, very helpful. Um, well, thank you so much, Fred, for joining us. Um, if you guys ever want to get Fred a birthday or thank you present, he likes classic movies and biking in the mountains. So there's your mental <laughs> note there. Um, hey, <laughs> Guys, just so you know, um, for the next several weeks, Wednesday nights at 8 p.m., we will be um, having different webinars uh, with different topics to help you. Um, we're not going to ask for anything in return. They will all be free. Uh, simply the goal is so that you can uh, know how to best lead yourself and your family. Next week, we're doing one on healthy social media practices for teenagers. So it's almost like the sequel to this week, as Fred has been talking a lot about how to navigate with kids and a lot of the questions were even steered towards 
elementary and younger, um, a little bit of teenagers as well. Next week is, is diving into that with uh, some of the student ministry team and uh, some of the resources and some of the things to just be aware of if you have um, especially older middle schoolers and high schoolers. Um, we're going to do one on mental health. We're going to do one on parenting um, that, that is more specific uh, to the marriage side uh, of things and um, just a few others coming up. So go to that'sgrace.org slash webinar um, so that you can, or webinars, that'sgrace.org slash webinars so that you uh, can see what is coming up. Hey, Fred, thank you so, so much for taking the time to do this. I know you're still in your office, which means that you've probably been there for a very, very long day. So I do want to thank you um, for taking the time to be with us. Stephen, it's been a pleasure to be with you. Thank yeah. you for having me. Thank you guys for tuning in. Um, and we are praying with you as we always say at the end of any of the things that we do at Grace Church. Um, if you are in need, we are here for you, whether you call Grace Church your home or not. Um, we to be the kind of church um, that is making the community a better place to live, whether the families ever step into our church walls at all. We want our towns that we live in um, to be better places to raise uh, th their kids because of the resources that we are providing. So thank you guys so much. Hopefully we'll see you in the next one. Thanks, Fred.